Thank you for joining my presentation on non-invasive ventilation overview methods of delivery. My name is Terrence Shenfield and I have been an education coordinator most of my career. I am also the co-owner of a and Lectures and Atacam Nursing Conferences. At the end of this presentation, you're gonna have a good handle understanding how non-invasive ventilation works, both in the hospital as well as at home. Before we get much further, I want to ask some questions. I wanna stimulate your thoughts. I want you to sort of have a better handle understanding non-invasive ventilation. So with a piece of paper or on the Q&A, can you please type in or write in when can non-invasive ventilation be indicated? What, so what kind of conditions do we use non-invasive ventilation? When is it indicated versus invasive ventilation? Okay, so answer that question. And at the end of this presentation, we're gonna go over all the answers. I have another couple of questions I'm gonna ask you, and it's gonna be the same pattern. Number two, when is non-invasive ventilation contraindicated. What kind of conditions is non-invasive ventilation contraindicated? Again, put your answers on a piece of paper or put it in the Q&A. And at the end of this presentation, we're going to go over each of these questions. I'm going to really get a good handle on why things work the way they do. Our last question, which ventilator is the best choice for non-invasive ventilation? So which ventilator is best? Is it an ICU vent? Is it a BiPAP? What kind of ventilator is the best choice for non-invasive ventilation? Put down your thoughts. I wanna make you think about what this answer would be. And then we're gonna go over the answers a little bit later. Okay, so that's our introduction. That's enough to get you off the ground and moving. So what are the benefits of non-invasive ventilation? There's a ton of benefits. The number one benefit is that you don't intubate the patient. You don't put an invasive airway into the patient that could potentially uh, make the patient worse by increasing their hospital stay. Non-invasive ventilation unloads the respiratory muscles and supports their ventilation. The purpose of non-invasive ventilation is to improve their tidal volumes, decrease their minute ventilation, improve their oxygenation, all at the same time without intubating them. Many patients who fail the next extubation attempt can be put on non-invasive ventilation and do very well. Many patients who have a COPD exasperation, rather than intubate them, put them on NIV. Many patients with congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema, rather than intubate them, put them on NIV. The list goes on and on and on about the benefits of non-invasive ventilation. And with, at the end of this presentation, you're gonna have a good handle on why things work the way they do. Today's learning objectives are, list the goals and benefits of non-invasive ventilation, discuss indications for NIV and the relative strength of the supporting evidence for each indication, List the selection and exclusion criteria for successful NIV. List the factors that predict successful NIV. Describe how to recognize NIV failure. Identify the types of patients interfaces available for NIV and describe how to choose an appropriate interface for a patient. List common interface-related adverse effects and discuss how to avoid them. Discuss the type of mechanical ventilators and ventilation modes used to provide NIV. Discuss the causes and resolution of patient ventilator asynchrony in NIV. Describe the role of the respiratory therapist during the initial application of NIV. Describe the ongoing ventilator management of NIV in the acute care setting, and then list potential complications associated with NIV and possible solutions. So we have a pretty full plate of learning objectives for today, and we're gonna cover each and every one of them. At the end of this presentation, you're gonna have a good handle on how to use NIV. So let's start the conversation about non-invasive ventilation. 
in basic terms, non-invasive ventilation is something we've done probably many times at the bedside. Think of an ambu bag and think of a face mask and where you ventilated the patient non-invasively um, to actually augment their tidal volumes. A lot of times, NIV can be quite beneficial to patients because the fact is you're not intubating them. NIV differs from CPAP in that NIV provides two levels of pressures. During NIV, pressure increases during the inspiratory phase of the breath and returns to an elevated baseline during exhalation. That elevated exhalation baseline is CPAP. The pressure increase during the inspiratory phase augments tidal volume. So as this pressure goes up, so does the tidal volume. So thus, this improves gas exchange and it actually unloads respiratory muscles. Now, when we talk about CPAP, during CPAP, pressures are elevated above atmospheric pressure, but remain constant throughout both the inspiratory phase and expiratory phase. CPAP increases functional residual capacity. It also increases the mean airway pressure. It does improve oxygenation, but it does not unload inspiratory muscles like NIV. So the difference is NIV has two pressures, CPAP has one pressure, NIV augments tidal volume and blows off CO2. So those are the basic differences between CPAP and NIV. So let's talk about some of the goals and benefits of using NIV, in particular in an acute care setting. Most of my experience comes from a major trauma center in Newark, New Jersey, where um, we had many, we had nine different ICUs, and we used NIV quite extensively. And some of the real benefits of NIV, especially with patients who had an exasperation of COPD, or someone who had cardiogenic pulmonary edema, or someone who failed an extubation attempt, or someone who was a neuromuscular patient, or someone who came out of the uh, post-recovery with too much anesthesia on board, we avoided intubating those patients. So there was a lot of benefits. Some of the key benefits is number one, you can improve gas exchange. NIV benefits the patient by augmenting the tidal volume, increasing their tidal volume, giving them a better, the better ability to blow off CO2. So that's like number one. Number two, you avoid intubation. We all know the risk of intubation. Some patients, especially the COPD, is you put them on a ventilator, you intubate them, and they are the most difficult patients to wean off. Studies have shown that with the use of non-invasive ventilation, it decreases mortality, which is a very important thing. It also decreases the length of time on a ventilator. We had a protocol at our hospital. What we did was we would keep someone who was intubated and we'd be kind of aggressive on weaning them off the ventilator. And a lot of times we'd wean them off the ventilator and then put them on non-invasive ventilation right after they were extubated. And we had a pretty good success rate with that. Um, if you don't have someone intubated, you're gonna decrease the length of hospitalization, saves money, saves the likelihood of getting VAP, which is the second thing, you know, decrease the incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, it relieves the symptoms of respiratory distress. Um, now, in re regard regarding patient ventilator synchrony, um, you really got to set up the patient correctly with the right interface, the right mask to actually get the, the NIV device and the patient is synchronized. Also, it maximized patient comfort. We had many patients who would be on NIV that we could just give them a little break, put them on a nasal cannula, and they could eat. So there's a lot of benefits of using NIV in the ICU setting or the acute care setting. And this was a short list of some of these benefits. So let's turn our attention to the goals and benefits of using non-invasive ventilation for home settings. This could be for a home setting or a long-term care facility where you use non-invasive ventilation for patients. Um, the benefits of non-invasive ventilation for home patients is well established. 
Many patients who have restricted thoracic disorders or neuromuscular disorders do very well with this non-invasive ventilation practices. It relieves symptoms, it enhances the quality of life, it avoids hospitalizations, it increases the survivability, and this has really worked very well. The group, they also use this for patients with um, end-stage COPD. A lot of patients with end-stage COPD who live at home um, use a non-invasive ventilation at home. They use BiPAP. Um, this sort of mixed evidence out there on the benefits of home use with um, non-invasive ventilation for this particular group. Uh, one of the major concerns with this is that these patients um, who use the non-invasive ventilation end up getting air trapping. This positive pressure ventilation that comes from the non-invasive device will actually um, shorten the diaphragm and actually reduce breath. So that is one of the problems they have with end-stage COPD patients at home. But the goals for other patients, neuromuscular patients, and I also mentioned thoracic uh, restrictive disorders, is very high. So this is a great tool to use in these kind of settings. So let's discuss some of the cases that really benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation. And the first one we're gonna start off with is COPD. Patients who suffer from exasperations of COPD who come into the emergency room are typically not intubated. The typical first line defense for acute exasperation of COPD is non-invasive ventilation. There's a ton of evidence, they've done numerous studies showing that NIV will inflate the lungs, increase the miniventilation, increase their tidal volume, and blow off CO2. It actually decreases the need for intubation. Intubation is a hazard in itself. Actually, the hospital stay, they looked at mortality data and length of stay, that has decreased. They looked at ICU, ICU admissions, that has um, decreased. Also, they looked at complications. So the concept of using intubation for a COPD is really non-existent these days. 90% of the time, they will put the patient on non-invasive ventilation and they do very well. Um, little tidbit of information, if they fail conventional therapy on non-invasive ventilation after one hour of care, you should intubate. You can't just, you know, keep them going. So the point is, you know, set them up properly the first time and there's strong evidence that it works perfectly with COPD patients. Let's talk about the patient who comes into the emergency room with status asthmaticus. A very severe asthmatic who potentially may have to be intubated may want to try NIV. Now, it may seem reasonable that they can't take a deep breath, but the problem is they have a lot of air trapping. So you have airway closure, airway trapping, hyperinflation of the lungs. So when you, inter when you introduce positive pressure ventilation, even though it's non-invasive ventilation, the patient may not be able to uh, exhale properly. So some of the studies, they've done some studies on this, and they, there's, um, you would think it would work, but they're really not too sure, and they really feel it may worsen the condition, especially if you have an acute asthma attack. They suggested that there are patients who do not want to be intubated, who want to try NIV, and you may want to try that on those patients. Um, the only thing, it, what you could do is you try to make them have a slow, tell them to slow down their respiratory rate so they could have more time to exhale, obviously bronchodilators, steroids, and things like that. But the evidence for asthma and on NIV is a little bit inconclusive, and they really feel it may worsen the patient by the form of air trapping. So how about the use of non-invasive ventilation with a patient who's weaning from uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, they've done uh, many studies with this and they found that certain populations benefit more than other patients. For example, COPD patients, patients who are COPDers who are intubated and then you wanna extubate them, 
may do much better using non-invasive ventilation as a tool to help them when they get extubated. They also use this for patients who have neuromuscular disease, and they found that they benefit too. So the use of non-invasive ventilation in the regarding to weaning of patients is pretty high. It's like good, some good evidence showing that it may help a patient, especially if someone who failed an extubation attempt and needs to be reintubated. At our facility, if someone failed an extubation attempt straight out, you know, they would be reintubated. And the second time we tried to wean them from the ventilator, we had a BiPAP standing right by the bedside. So what we would do is extubate them to BiPAP, and we had a good success with that. So the point is this, NIV and weaning can work hand in hand, especially with special populations, neuromuscular patients, COPD patients, and those who have failed multiple extubation attempts, and you need to sort of make it happen the right way. So these are some of the cases you might want to look at. Regarding hypoxemic respiratory failure, NIV has been very good for hypercapnic patients, especially with COPD, but there's been conflicting results of patients who have normal uh, CO2 but are hypoxic. Um, actually, the results are quite mixed, and they don't recommend the use of non-invasive ventilation for those who are hypoxic. So I would suggest that you really don't consider that. But if the patient has hypercapnia as well as hypoxic, then it would be a good choice. Another good choice for non-invasive ventilation is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And in particular, we're talking about CPAP. CPAP increases the functional residual capacity of the lung. It also increase, increases the mean airway pressure. And a positive pressure ventilation actually flushes out fluid that's uh, in the alveola from the edema. So yes, um, NIV or CPAP is very good for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but in regard to hypoxemic respiratory failure, unless it's also with hypercapnia, I would avoid it. Here's another couple of conditions that you may wanna consider not using NIV. For example, if a patient has pneumonia, Many times patients with COPD progress into getting pneumonia and then like the typical plan would be to put them on NIV. And evidence has shown that patients with pneumonia do not respond well to non-invasive ventilation. You'd be much better off with this patient to put them on a high flow nasal cannula, which the outcomes have been proven to be a lot better. Let's talk about acute lung injury and ARDS. These are patients who have a PF ratio of less than 300 and maybe even 200. And because of their condition and because of their low PF ratios, um, the use of non-invasive ventilation is not recommended at all. You bet much better to intubate these patients, especially if they got a PF ratio less than 175. So studies um, support not using NIV in the acute lung injury patients, or ARDS patients, and this could be gauged by the PF ratio and also clinical signs of uh, being acute lung injury and in ARDS. So these are two conditions you wanna avoid using NIV, pneumonia and acute lung injury. It doesn't work well with these populations. This is an interesting slide. Um, they use non-invasive ventilation for patients who were immunocompromised, who were awaiting to get solid organ transplantation. So they were organ transplant patients. Some of them developed hypoxemic respiratory failure. And rather than intubate them, they put them on non-invasive ventilation. And based upon the study they did, they found they had decreased intubation rates, decreased mortality, compared to standard therapy. So it seems like this population did very well with non-invasive ventilation. Let's talk about um, patients who are receiving comfort care. Think of palliative care or hospice. A lot of times these patients are in respiratory distress. 
And it's a common measure sometimes to use non-invasive ventilation to support the ventilation to make them more comfortable. It's not really a point of making them better because, you know, obviously they're terminal, but at one point you're just making them a little bit more comfortable. So anyone who's on palliative care or hospice care or comfort care, they can benefit from non-invasive ventilation as compared to normal nasal cannula and such. Um, also, they were looking at post-operative patients. We've had many patients from our hospital who come out of post-operative and rather than intubate them, they put them on non-invasive ventilation and they did very well. The, the bad part of this is that there's not much evidence supporting this. So even though we use this practice ourselves, and I would endorse it, when I was looking for the evidence, I couldn't find much evidence out there supporting post-operative patients using non-invasive ventilation. So these are three different scenarios. Immunocompromised patients did very well with it. Comfort care patients did very well. Post-operative patients, from my own personal experience, did pretty good, but that's not what the evidence is showing, so I don't want to say one thing or another with that. Let's further the conversation about post-operative respiratory failure. As I was telling you, the evidence really doesn't support it, um, especially for those who, if you're hypercapnic, that's one thing. It seems to benefit patients who are hypercapnic. But if your problem is hypoxemia or hypoxia, that they don't particularly benefit and you'd rather best off to intubate them. Also, they talk about the prevention of reintubation in high-risk patients. Studies have supported the use of non-invasive ventilation for patients who have failed extubation attempts. We have done very well with this population where patients have failed extubation and rather than reintubate them, we put them on non-invasive ventilation and they did well. Um, the patients who are hypercapnic did the best. So it seems like the studies support the use of um, non-invasive ventilation to reduce reintubation rates. And we practiced this at our hospital and we did a very good job with it. So I, I endorse it myself. Let's talk about the stable COPD. -er. This is a patient who's not admitted at the hospital. He's staying home, but due to hypercapnia and because of a shortness of breath and because of the progression of his disease, decides to use non-invasive ventilation, even like the picture shows, sitting at home like this. Um, positive pressure has a lot, of, a lot of good things to it. It actually unloads the respiratory muscles, um, gives you a better tidal volume, maintains your blood gas, you know, your PCO2 at good levels. It actually improves nocturnal hypoventilation syndrome and actually improves sleep disordered breathing. A lot of COPDs have um, hypoventilation syndrome, the D sac during the night, and they also have sleep disordered breathing, just like obstructive sleep apnea. But, you know, this is a different case. But the problem is, is much widespread use of it it's not really, they haven't done any some good significant studies to show the benefit of it. Even though it's being used widely across America, um, they really haven't had good evidence. But that doesn't mean you can't continue doing it. Basically, there's a lot of patients who stay home, use their non-invasive ventilation device at home. They're not admitted to the hospital. It improves their sleep quality. It improves their nocturnal hypoventilation. So there is some benefits to it. Another particular group that does very well with this, with non-invasive ventilation, is the obesity hypoventilation syndrome, Pickwickian syndrome. These people are typically obese. They have a body mass index greater than 30. They have a daytime um, PCO2 greater than 45 and what they need, they need to take some kind of non-invasive ventilation or CPAP to normalize their blood gas and they actually desat at night. They have what they call nocturnal desaturations. Now um, they did a study of CPAP versus non-invasive ventilation and they found that both were effective for decreasing daytime PCO2 levels. Um, so 
Nocturnal non-invasive ventilation might be better than CPAP for this particular group. I actually did another PowerPoint on this. I did some studies on obesity hypoventilation syndrome, and there's a mode called AVAPS, Average Volume Assured Pressure Support. And what they did is they had two groups of patients, one receiving non-invasive ventilation traditionally, and the other one receiving the AVAPS mode. And they found that the patients with the AVAPS mode actually had a more um, balanced PCO2, the pH became more stabilized. They were much better than just plain um, non-invasive ventilation. So this is a population that benefits from the use of non-invasive ventilation. And I've read some studies and actually did a presentation on the use of AVAPS in this population, which actually has shown it to be more superior. So what is the appropriate patient to put on non-invasive ventilation? How do you assess the patient that they would be a good candidate? There's a few things you gotta look at. Number one, they have to be in acute respiratory failure, and that could be either mean they're hypoxemic or they are hypercapnic. You gotta look for a use of accessory muscles, such as the trapezes, the scalenes, the intercostals. If you see those muscles being activated, you really know there's a problem. Paradoxal breathing. Paradoxal breathing means that the diaphragm moves in an opposite way than it should be. Typically, when you inhale, the diaphragm goes down. But if you see the diaphragm going up as they're inhaling, that's paradoxal breathing. If their respiratory rate is 25 or greater, that's another sign. Um, if they have severe shortness of breath, dyspnea. If their PCO2 is greater than 45, but their pH is less than 7.35, that's another indicator. And if you've got a PF ratio less than 200, I wouldn't even say put them on uh, non-invasive ventilation. You've got to intubate them. That's ARDS. Anything with a PF ratio less than 200, you intubate. But according to some guidelines, you could put them on non-invasive ventilation, but I would not recommend it. So some of these are the signs that you want to put someone on non-invasive ventilation, and you should just do an assessment to see how well they would do. So with every patient, there are exclusion criteria. That means patients who are in acute respiratory failure but are not candidates for NIV. First of all, if the patient goes apneic. If the patient goes apneic, you gotta intubate them. Anyone who has a risky airway, if someone you could suspect might aspirate or if they have a difficult airway, that would be another, any kind of face trauma. Anyone who's hemodynamically or cardiac instability is another one. If someone is lack, if they don't follow directions and they lack instructions and in what you're telling them to do and they don't really seem to be with it, definitely that's a contraindication you gotta intubate. Um, if there's any kind of facial burns, trauma or anything or abnormality to the airway, definitely you have to intubate. If they have excessive amounts of secretions, another good indication why you should not um, use non-invasive ventilation and you should intubate. So these are the signs that you do not use non-invasive ventilation and you should know them because you wanna pick the best candidate because you want a success rate with what you do. So now that you have the patient on non-invasive ventilation in the ICU, because we're talking about acute settings, how do you know if they're gonna do well? And there are certain criteria you gotta look at. Number one, if you put the mask on the patient and it's a properly fitting mask and it's not too tight, the straps are not too tight and it doesn't cause any kind of necrosis or skin breakdown, and you have a leak of less than 24 liters per minute, that is a good thing. That means that that non-invasive device and the mask interface is working well. Another thing, you have to make sure that the patient has a low severity of illness. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can't have someone come in who's 75 years old, um, has COPD, exasperation, hypertension, diabetes, and all of these things would make this patient an, a, a failed candidate for non-invasive ventilation. You probably would be best to intubate them. They have these severity scores. An example of a severity score is called an Apache 2 score. 
And based upon that score, you could tell whether they're going to succeed or not. Uh, Apache scores are basically when a patient's admitted to the hospital, say two patients, you have a 45 year old patient who's admitted to the hospital for um, um, pneumonia and they have no kind of comorbidities. They don't have hypertension. They don't have this, but they have pneumonia. Then you get someone comes into the hospital who's 76 years old, who has the same kind of pneumonia, but they have hypertension. They have uh, diabetes. They got this problem. They got this problem. They got congestive heart failure. Their Apache score will be much higher. So the lower the Apache score or the lower the severity of illness score, the greater likelihood they would be a success with non-invasive ventilation. Let's talk about respiratory acidosis. If the PCO2 is greater than 45 but less than 92, they're a viable candidate. If the pH is less than 7.35 but greater than 7.2, again, they're a viable candidate. Now, what's very important is you need to see an improvement in gas exchange within one to two hours of initiation of non-invasive ventilation. What that means is if you put someone on non-invasive ventilation and they fail and, you know, they're not doing no, there's no change in the blood gas. They're, they're exactly the same or in worse con condition, they're worse. Um, stop the NIV and put the patient, intubate the patient. You should also see an improvement in uh, parameters such as respiratory rate and heart rate. They should go down based on, you know, if they're doing comfortable on this. So these are some of the predictors of a successful use of non-invasive ventilation in the ICU setting. Let's turn the conversation to restricted thoracic disease, especially with patients who need non-invasive ventilation at night. Many patients suffer from pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, obesity, ALS, and as a result of this, they have chronic hypoventilation and many of them lack sleep quality. So with these kind of patients, it, this is a strong indication to use non-invasive ventilation. Some of the parameters you should be looking for if they have a PCO2 greater than 45, uh, they have nocturnal O2 saturations that go less than 88% for more than five minutes. The MIP is less than 60, or the force vital capacity is less than 50% of predicted. Many of these patients benefit from the use of non-invasive ventilation at night, and especially those with restrictive disorders. So this is a clear indication for the use of non-invasive ventilation and it's, it's been proven to uh, be quite effective in numerous studies. There's another group of patients who could benefit from non-invasive ventilation, and the typical reason for that is nocturnal hypoventilation. A lot of these patients are obese, and you've heard of Pickwickian syndrome. It also could be a central nervous system disorder. It could be a respiratory disorder. It could be uh, something wrong with the air, anatomical differences with the airway. So with these patients, they really do quite well with using non-invasive ventilation. So we're talking about patients who don't have restrictive lung disease or COPD. So the first line of defense with these patients is to lose weight. And I know that's easier said than done. A lot of these patients are also on low dose um, oxygen therapy because many of them desat way below 88% for long periods at night. You could also use respiratory stimulants uh, with these patients. Sometimes this is good for central nervous system, uh, uh, dr central drives with the respiratory system. You could also use nasal CPAP, which is very effective. But in these severe cases, non-invasive ventilation is really the go-to choice for managing these patients. But obviously, you got to work on other types of defenses like I just mentioned earlier. Non-invasive ventilation is a major breakthrough in the treatment of patients with acute respiratory failure, as well as chronic respiratory failure and sleep disordered breathing. 
despite the fact that we have advances in NIV technology, we have these new age ventilators, we have new BiPAP machines, the experience of the medical staff, failure rates for non-invasive ventilation remains very high, somewhere in the category of between 18 and 40%. The success of using NIV has a lot to do with staff experience, patient cooperation, and then to a large extent, fitting the proper mask. I could not overly emphasize how important it is to have a properly fitting mask. And I'm gonna show you a little bit how to set up a mask on the next slide. The success of non-invasive ventilation depends on several factors, and the most important factor is patient cooperation and proper interface. You need to sort of set up the proper mask, if it's a full face mask, if it's an oral nasal mask, if it's a, a helmet, you really need to understand exactly how to set this mask up, how to let the patient expect certain parameters with the mask, and you need to not overly tighten the straps. Many patients uh, complain about the straps being too tight, and I'll show you on the next slide what happens when you have patients who have all kinds of overly tightened straps. So picking the right mask for the right patient and actually doing some good education with them is paramount. As I mentioned on a previous slide, Having a proper fitting mask is so important. Failure rates are anywhere from 18 to 40 percent, and most of the time it's due to mask discomfort, skin lesions, and excessive leaks. It seems that whenever we put a patient on non invasive ventilation, if we feel a big leak around the mask, we end up tightening the straps on the mask. This can result in the picture you see here on the right. This poor woman has all this uh, necrotic tissue by her, the bridge of her nose as a result of a mask not being properly fitted. So to make mask fitting more successful, you have to size the mask properly for the patient. Proper fitting mask is imperative to making a successful interaction with non-invasive ventilation. It reduces the incidence of pressure sores, tissue necrosis. Um, you know, I was telling you on earlier slides that it's acceptable to have a leak, but you want to have a leak less than 24 liters per minute. And if you get a proper fitting mask, you can get that. You don't tighten the straps, rather, if, if, the, if the mask doesn't fit properly, don't tighten the straps to, you know, to reduce the leak, get the proper fitting mask. Also, this increases patient comfort. If the patient's comfortable with non-invasive ventilation, they will be more compliant with using it. And especially the patients who are at home, who use non-invasive ventilation at home, you really have to have the right type of uh, mask. Now they got all these gel um, apparatuses that could fit inside the, um, the non-invasive mask, the oral nasal mask. They have all these kind of bells and whistles with it. You just gotta find the right one that works for the patient. You gotta make sure you have a reduced leak, you have patient comfort. You also have to have that the, and explain to them the value of what the use of non-invasive ventilation is. So it's uh, not an easy scenario to, to keep up with, but this is what you don't want. This is a poster child of uh, someone you don't want to see under your care. So what are the characteristics of a good fitting mask that will prevent breakdown? The choice of this is dependent upon the characteristics of the facial anatomy and the breathing pattern of the patient. Basically, nasal masks are best used for patients who are gonna be on long-term support. So a nasal mask with a chin strap can be beneficial for most of these patients. So, you know, you gotta base it on the facial anatomy the level of comfort and the breathing pattern. On the left, I have a graph, I have a, a chart of some things you wanna look at and it's broken down by both the mass system and the securing system. 
On the top, we have the mass system. It has to be leak-free. It, it has to be stable. It has to be lightweight. It has to have non-allergenic material. It has to have minimal dead space. Um, and it has to be available in various sizes based upon this, the patient. In regard to the securing system, which is really important too, because you don't want the mask to be dislodged or not fitting properly on the face. Um, you want it to be able to put on and take off kind of easy. Uh, you want it to be very light material. You want it to have a breathable material. Again, you need various sizes based upon the patient's face. And if they're on home, if they use a mask at home, it has to be washable. And if it's in the hospital, obviously it'd be disposable. So some of these clear guidelines can help. Every manufacturer has its own way of doing things. And I just wanted to give you a broad overview of exactly what you're looking for. So now we're at a point where we're gonna put the patient on non-invasive ventilation. We know what kind of patient it is. We know what kind of parameters we have. We also know our settings. My next slide is going to be talking about settings. So number one, when you set up a non-invasive device, you have to choose to put the device in a place that could be basically monitored by nursing and respiratory staff. So if you have someone who's really kind of critically ill and you put them on non-invasive ventilation, you want to have them with an eyesight of you. Number two, you put them, they're in the bed, you elevate their head to at least a 30 degree angle. So they're sitting up on the bed. They're not flat, they're not in a supine position. And then at this point, you could actually put the mask. Then what you do is you select the ventilator and you get the right size mask. And getting the right size mask based upon the manufacturer's suggestion, you know, they got all these little plastic things that could fit over the nose and you could find out exactly what size mask they are. And also, you know, you have a choice of using, a lot of people use non-invasive ventilation instead of using a BiPAP machine like a V60, they will actually use a ventilator. And we used to do at our place, we used to be a Draga house and we would take our Draga ventilator and put it in NIV mode and use that as a BiPAP. Or if you happen to have a V60 or any other kind of device, uh, you know, you set it up. And then some places use humidification. Uh, we used to use humidification. We felt it was a lot more comfortable for the patient. And so if you have a ventilator or if you have a BiPAP device and you have humidification and you connect the, you use the right interface, you're ready to go. My next slide is gonna be talking about some basic settings that are on the non-invasive ventilation, something that, you know, is sort of universal. So remember, choose the right location based on severity, put the patient at a 30 degree, uh, at least 30 degrees sitting up in the bed, Number three, pick either a ventilator or a BiPAP machine. Make sure you fit the mask properly. Every manufacturer has a little chart on how to fit the mask. Also, um, you know, turn the ventilator on, put some, if, if you happen to have humidification, put that, put the interface on, put the settings on, on the ventilator and start it up. And my next slide is going to go a little bit more detail on that. Okay, now let's start talking about some basic terminology that is used for um, non-invasive ventilation. And you should get to understand some of these terms. I'm sure you know it. Um, for those who have been in the field a long time, this is old news. For those who are new in the field, you, you might learn something from this. And let's go. Um, the basic settings for non-invasive ventilation, and this is based on the condition of the patient, is you set your IPAP setting, you set your EPAP setting, you, you set up your backup rate, you set up your trigger, you set up your pressure rise time, and you possibly could be setting up your FiO2 to be bled into the system, or it could be automatic. They could have a um, you know, a titrating FiO2 with the system. So let's break down each particular setting. IPAP. IPAP, another word for IPAP is PIP, P-I-P, or peak inspiratory pressure. And basically, IPAP stands for inspiratory positive airway pressure. 
think of this as a pressure that is used to inflate the lung. So IPAP is like an inspiratory pressure and it, it, it inflates the lung. EPAP, another word for EPAP, a lot of people think of EPAP as PEEP. And EPAP is a setting that once the pressure is, it sort of creates a back pressure like PEEP in the system. So the difference between IPAP and EPAP is what is known as driving pressure or pressure support. So that is like your driving pressure. Now, for example, how much IPAP do you need? How much EPAP do you need? And when you think about it, you need to create, if the patient has CO2, retaining CO2 is a COPD, you want to give enough IPAP pressure to get a return to the volume that can blow off some of the CO2. So you don't, and remember the difference between IPAP and EPAP is pressure support. So if you have an IPAP set at 10 and you have an EPAP set up at five, the change between IPAP and EPAP is five. So a pressure support of five is not much at all. So think about that. So the difference between the IPAP level and EPAP level has to be significant enough that it will give inspiratory pressure to help support the patient. So remember this, IPAP minus EPAP is the driving pressure or it could be called the delta pressure. The backup rate is actually, this ensures that if the patient doesn't trigger a breath, that they, the ventilator will trigger, the BiPAP will trigger a breath. And the backup rate has to be set less than the patient's spontaneous breath. You cannot set a backup rate higher than the patient's spontaneous rate. So always set a backup rate like eight to 10. That's a good number to start off with. Inspiratory trigger. What is inspiratory trigger? Inspiratory trigger is how sensitive the, the BiPAP machine will sense a breath. So if the patient takes a breath, you want the ventilator or the BiPAP machine to actually pick up that trigger. And so you want to set it low enough that it can pick up a patient's breath, but does not cause auto triggering. A lot of times when we set this up on a, a patient, you will auto trigger it. You will put it so sensitive that it would auto trigger, then you back off a little. So it would pick up that um, even short little breath the patient has. And then um, there's a pressure rise time. That's another setting that goes on. This is the time needed for the airway pressure to increase from EPAP to IPAP. So it's actually how much flow goes into the system is called the pressure rise time. And all depends on what kind of condition the patient is in where you would set that. And then I don't have FiO2 here, but some, some ventilators, you could bleed in FiO2 oxygen. You could also at the same time, um, you could set an, a, a level of FiO2. So remember these basic settings, IPAP, EPAP, driving pressure, backup rate, tr inspiratory trigger, pressure rise time. And some ventilators have all these other bells and whistles. So I've worked with ventilators that had AVAPs on it. I, I think I was mentioning that earlier in my presentation that um, we used to use that for patient with Pequinian syndrome or hypoventilation syndrome. We used to use AVAPs instead of using IPAP and EPAP. We would do that way. Well, actually it's still part of it. All right, so those are your basic settings and I want you to be aware of how to set them up. So you have your patient on non-invasive ventilation and you have them on for about an hour. How do you know if this is working? How do you know you are succeeding in your plan to not intubate them? Number one, if you see an improved ABG, if the PCO2 decreases, like in case of um, hypercapnic uh, COPD uh, exasperation, the pH increases, the PAO2 increases, these are very clear telltale signs that everything is working. If you see a decrease in respiratory rate, uh, increase in tidal volumes, diminished accessory muscle use, you're in the right track. If that is happening, continue doing what you were doing. This is very important. Suppose you get a blood gas in an hour and they are not improving. They are not improving and 
they're maybe even potentially getting worse. I would count this as a failure. Do not change the settings. Do not keep them on the BiPAP machine. What you need to do at this point is intubate them. Numerous studies show that if someone fails BiPAP for one hour, now I noticed I got two hours. If someone fails BiPAP after one hour or two hours and you don't intubate them, the mortality rate goes up through the roof. So you really got to, you're giving your best effort to improve their oxygenation and reduce their CO2 and all these things, including their clinical improvement with their respiratory rate. But if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen, you really need to stop it and then intubate the patient. Let's talk about some adjustments you may do based upon your blood gas. So you got someone on the BiPAP machine and you get an ABG about an hour later and you notice that the PCO2 is high. What do you do? The idea if your PCO2 is high, you have to increase the pressure. So you might have to increase your IPAP level. If you have low PCO2, you have to decrease the pressure. So the key point here, for high PCO2, you have to increase the IPAP level. For low PCO2, you have to decrease the IPAP level. Suppose you have a high PAO2. There are a couple of things you could do. Number one, you could decrease the supplemental oxygen being bled in, or you could lower the EPAP level. One thing I have to remind you though, when you start changing the IPAP and EPAP level and the delta in between, remember I was telling you about the driving pressure, it can change the tidal volume and it could change your PCO2. So you gotta be very, very careful. Like if I drop my, if my IPAP level is 15 and my EPAP level is seven, that means my driving pressure is eight. If I lower my drive, my IPAP level to say um, 12, it's going to lower my driving pressure, lower my pressure support, possibly increasing the CO2 level. So you really got to work together with the IPAP and EPAP. They sort of go work harmoniously together. And so these are some basic adjustments you could do. And um, no ventilator is without adjustment. So you need to understand how this works. I get this question a lot. Is it better to use a ventilator, an ICU ventilator in non-invasive mode versus a BiPAP device? Which one is better? And it's kind of tricky. First of all, it's convenient to have a ICU ventilator that you could use non-invasive ventilation. There's a couple of advantages of that. Number one, you could measure exhale tidal volumes more effectively with that particular system versus a BiPAP machine. Uh, because it's a, a double, well, it could be a double limb or single limb circuit that you use, but if it's a double limb circuit, you know, the exhalation valve will measure the tidal volumes coming out. There's a downside to that. One of the downside is that leak compensation. It seems that the critical care ventilators, the ICU ventilators that you use as a BiPAP device, do not perform very well in the presence of leaks. In other words, I also think the inspiratory flow of the system is less than a BiPAP device. I know, for example, uh, the V60 has a flow of 240 liters per minute and I remember an RICU ventilator had a flow of 160 liters per minute. So if you had a leak that was pretty significant, you may not have enough flow coming out of the ICU ventilator and using an NIV to compensate. So the key point is it depends. I don't think anything can really take the place of a good BiPAP machine. And I'm not going to label what's a good BiPAP machine. You know which ones are good um, in the ICU. Uh, is it convenient to use a dual limb circuit for non-invasive ventilation in the ICU? Absolutely. You could extubate someone and then you could just e automatically just set it up. But remember, the problem comes with the ability uh, to deliver breaths in the presence of a large leak. So 
I am of the thought that it's better to use a BiPAP device in the ICU. So here are a review of some of the questions we had at the beginning. When can non-invasive ventilation be indicated? What are the best cases to use it? And the answer is, if you have one who's in a COPD exasperation and their PCO2, you want to blow off their CO2. If you have cardiogenic pulmonary edema, it's another advantage of non-invasive ventilation. This is a great time to use your BiPAP. Um, also, it could be used on neuromuscular patients who are hypoventilating. So these are some clean scenarios that you could actually use it on the patient. Second question, when is non-invasive ventilation contraindicated? What kind of case is it at? Put it in the Q&A. The answer is, it's if someone is not responsive, that they don't follow commands, they are not a good candidate for non-invasive ventilation. If someone has excessive secretions, it's a not a good candidate. If someone is septic, they're not a good candidate. Someone in ARDS, not a good candidate. So these are some strong contraindications for the use of not using non-invasive ventilation when you should be intubating them. This is a trick question. Which ventilator is the best choice for non-invasive ventilation? It all depends. It all depends on the clinician's skill to use the ventilator. Probably every type of ventilator out there in the market today is at least these modern generation ventilators and modern generation BiPAPs are all good. Um, as I mentioned on a couple of slides ago, in regard to the presence of a large leak, I would absolutely not use a ventilator for non-invasive ventilation. I would actually use a BiPAP device and you can figure out which BiPAP device you wanna use. So is any one better than the other? Not really. It all depends on the skills of the clinician. Thank you for joining my presentation. Our summary slides has a few bulleted points. Number one, Non-invasive ventilation is a great tool. If you can avoid intubation in special patients, you know, COPDers, uh, patients with neuromuscular disease, patients who have uh, not cardiac, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, great tool to use. Number two, pay attention to the interface. Make sure that you follow the manufacturer's suggestions for fitting the interface. Make sure your leak is less than 24 liters per minute. Make sure you don't tighten the strap so much that you could cause some kind of necrosis to the tissue. Pay attention to contraindications of use. If someone is, has too much secretions, someone's not following commands, someone's non-compliant, they have some kind of facial abnormality that there's a big leak, you can't do it. Uh, also, it's better to use non-invasive ventilation rather than invasive ventilation. Obviously, there's so much evidence out there that once someone's intubated, you introduce all kinds of pathogens into the airway. So if you could avoid intubation and use NIV, that's the way to go. I want to thank you all for joining my presentation. This is a short list of references that you may want to use um, to further your understanding of how to use NIV. And I want to put a special thanks to Egan's Fundamental and my partner, Dr. Albert Yor, for sort of sharing some of these slides with me, which I used during this presentation. And you have a great day.